Sorry. All right, we're rolling. <laughs> so everyone, welcome Taylor. It's so funny. I feel like she's actually here, but virtually this time, like she's sitting at the desk. But um, to Taylor, nice to meet you. <laughs> Taylor is a reporter for Spectrum News, which is what we were talking about. So yes, yeah, Spectrum, the same company that actually like does Wi-Fi and everything like that. They now have a news station that runs 24 hours. And so Taylor reports for, virtually right now from a newsroom. She's not physically in the newsroom, but basically is able to report from her home and out and about in her community for, is it, it's for Cleveland. Right, is this technically the one or is it for Columbus? Yeah, so it's a statewide network, but my area is Cleveland. So I can go to other stories, but that means I have to plan ahead and drive that far. So I mainly stay around Cleveland. So, yeah, so this is like the first time we talked about, usually the people we've talked to have been like actually physically somewhere. Like she's basically completely mobile doing the same things that we've heard about before, you know, with reporting. So Taylor, if you're up for it, I think we can just kick it off. I'll share that video, share the screen real quick. And then if you want to talk about kind of how you piece it together and then just go into a Q&A, talk about your story and everything else. Sure. Sounds good. All right. So I'll share my screen. Michael, Andrea, thank you both for joining too, just so you guys can see it. Let's go to share a tab. I, I fixed the screen so it wouldn't look like that. <laughs> All right, so Taylor, I'm going to go and mute myself, and then you should be able to see it too because I'm sharing it. And then we'll convalescent plasma can be rich in antibodies and is derived from the blood donated by people who have recovered from the virus. In early July of 2020, 77 year old George Sortino was hospitalized with COVID 19 at Firelands Regional Medical Center in Sandusky. I thought it was the end of my life. I really did. That's how. So I was dealing with an unknown situation. I was so sick, I couldn't hold, I couldn't hold my cell phone. Sortino spent 12 days in the hospital's critical care unit fighting for his life. It's an emotional feeling. It, uh, what goes through your mind is uh, your life, your memories, your loved ones. You think of your, your children, you think of your grandchildren, you think of, your, of, uh, of my, 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 my bride. One of Sortino's doctors was pulmonologist Christopher Avendano. Seeking ways to help Sortino live, the hospital gave convalescent plasma to him. Sortino was the first patient at Firelands to receive the treatment. We felt like, okay, let's go ahead and try and give him this, which I'll be honest with you, took some time because we actually, you know, at that time, that was actually done, ex I don't want to say experimentally, but it was part of a study, as part of a program through Mayo Clinic called an expand expanded access program. Sortino believes receiving convalescent plasma was the start of his comeback. That was the difference. If I didn't, if I didn't get that, I don't think I'd be here talking to you. But not everyone in the medical community is sold on the treatment. Dr. Robert Salata is the physician in chief at University Hospitals of Cleveland. He says because of lack of good, robust studies, UH is not using convalescent plasma as a treatment right now. The various studies have not shown uh, significant benefit overall. And in fact, uh, both the NIH and um, the FDA, among others, have really um, suggested this should not be utilized except under circumstances of a clinical trial. There was a subset of folks, older folks like that, that did uh, demonstrate benefit, but it was not consistent across, across all age groups and through these studies such that uh, we basically are not using that as part of our treatment strategy right now. Dr. Avendano says there are patients at Firelands Hospital who've passed away from COVID-19 despite receiving convalescent plasma. When you're talking about an individual and you're talking to families, what you want to do is be able to tell them we did everything we could for them and whatever happened, happened because I think people can accept that knowing that everything was done for them than possible. Sortino shares his story to give hope to others that they too can make it and urges those who've recovered from COVID-19 to donate convalescent plasma to allow patients similar to him a potential second chance at life. You got nothing to lose. Uh, so why, why not try it? If it's available, try it. You know, you got nothing to lose, but, but, uh, but you, can gain, you can gain your life and extend your, your life with your loved ones as well. So. For Spectrum News, I'm Taylor Brock. Similar to like a blood, tra like a transplant that you would have. Okay. Like that. <laughs> Imagine getting, I'm sorry, this one, ew. Imagine getting somebody else's heart. Yeah, transplants. Like, physically. What? That's, that person ew. usually, I couldn't. 
All right, and we're about something. Living. So, 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 so somebody else is something. Yeah, living living. Your mind. <laughs> That's true. Okay, listen. If you're having heart problems and you need yeah. a heart transplant to live, I'm not then, then, I'm this will be. We'll, we'll save discussion for later about the transplant stuff because there is a lot to talk about with that. Um, I'm curious. But Taylor, well done. That was really well put together. I actually did not know about um, that type of plasma at all, and that was even a treatment option until that. And so um, I think it'd be kind of cool just to kick it off. If you want to just walk us through, like, how did you get the story from the beginning? Was it something that you pitched, something you were given? How'd you get the interviews? And then just how'd you put it all together? Like, that'd be kind of cool to hear about that. So, yeah, so I actually couldn't see your screen, but I watched the I watched the link from, because I've obviously put it together, so I've seen it a million times. Um, but basically, I was working on a story with the Red Cross. They had a blood drive that they've done for years and moved locations. So it was a simple story, but I actually found a patient that receives blood trans transfusions and that saved her life. So I was doing a story about that, and they were talking about convalescent plasma. And I was like, I'm always listening to people for new story ideas, and I felt like that's interesting. You know, they're collecting convalescent plasma. Are people benefiting from it? Are people not? So I decided to ask the Red Cross if they could find somebody that felt like convalescent plasma saved their life. They connected me with George Sortino. And then through that, I just reached out to the hospitals because there's a lot of hospitals in Cleveland that I'm connected with now. So I just reached out to the media contacts and ask if there's a doctor available to speak to. Through talking to them, they said, you know, we're not using convalescent plasma, but they can speak on why they're not. So that was one angle of it because you want to have both sides. You want to have people that are, you know, benefiting from it. And then somebody's not because you try to be try to get both sides in a news story. So I had George who said it. It saved his life. I had the university hospitals doctor saying they're not using it because there's not robust studies. And then I had the other doctor who gave it to them saying they are using it if, you know, they feel like they, they can save a patient with it. So it was just an interesting story. I, I wanted to hear about convalescent plasma. And then through my reporting, just found more about it. Like I didn't know university hospitals wasn't using it, but I thought that was an interesting piece to it. And I sent the link to the Red Cross and they were like, thank you. I didn't actually realize University Hospitals is not using it. So that's how it kind of came together. Just through interviewing people, you just learn more about the story and the angle that you're going to take, and you go from there. That's sweet. And then how did you get in touch? Were they pretty, were they up for interviews right away? Did it take some more discussion when you talked to George uh, Sertino and everything? Um, the university, was it pretty easy to actually make them agree to an interview, or did that take some time? Yeah, so the, the hospital systems are usually very responsive. Once you find the media contacts, I contact this guy named George from University Hospitals all the time, and he's very quick. So once you get a media contact, finding a doctor is not usually that difficult. Finding the character, the person that it affects is. And at Spectrum News, they're really pushing us to find a character rather than just doing a regular news story where I could have just had the doctors. I could have had University Hospitals saying they don't use it, and I could have had Fireland saying they do, and that could have been the story. But at Spectrum, we're really trying to push the character because people connect with people. So you want to find, you know, who's that person that it's affecting. Um, so without the Red Cross, I probably would have had a difficult time finding a patient because the hospitals can't really say, yes, this patient's going to speak to you. Um, but yeah, just you just ask around. I use social media a lot. Use your contacts when you have them. So I had the contact at the Red Cross, and he was really willing to help me out and find this person. appreciate you for sharing that and telling us all that too. Um, do you guys have any just like basic general questions that you'd like to shoot out at Taylor? Because I mean, I, I know something that might get you guys thinking too is just like, I guess the general question of why journalism, Taylor? So you will walk us back to the beginning of you before you went to OU and decided to pursue that and then now at Spectrum News, like why did you decide to go into journalism? I feel like Connor has a, a a similar path. Connor was an awesome journalism student at OU. He was always in the newsroom, always doing something. He helped me out with a really cool like drone shot that I used on my stand-up uh, for my reel when I was getting a job. So that looked really cool on my reel. Um, back just in high school, like I really love meeting people. I really love talking to people and getting to know their story. And I just feel like people are really unique and awesome. And I mean, people have really cool stories, so I want to use my journalistic skills, I guess, to share that. So that's really why I got into journalism, just because I I really like meeting new people and sharing their stories. And then by sharing other people's stories, then the people that are viewing them 
get to hear different perspectives and viewpoints. So that's really why I got into journalism. And I feel like I'm living my purpose every day. I love it. That's sweet. And then do you want to talk about, because I think a lot of them will be interested in this too, just like Tay Talks in general and kind of your, uh, just start doing your own kind of thing on YouTube. Um, because yeah, I feel like that's, I don't know. I think there's something there that would inspire just a lot of like high school students in general. Even me, I feel inspired when I saw those videos. So anything you want to share just about that? What made you decide to do them and what exactly like were they to you? Sure. Thank you for bringing that up. I haven't done a Tay Talk in a while just because I'm busy and I don't think, yeah, I'm just busy. But basically they stand for totally authentically you. And it just goes off my name, Taylor Tay. Um, and basically what I wanted to do was in order to get a job, like you've got to showcase that you're doing something at school. And so I was at WOUB and I was doing my um, Bobcat Entertainment News. So I was working in certain areas, but I wanted to showcase that I was like, I truly care about the industry, truly care about meeting people. And I also identify as gay. So I felt like that really fit into things. So being totally authentically you just I'm I'm a gay news reporter, you know what I mean? And so I was scared going into journalism, identifying as gay. But through these, I wanted to showcase you just need to be yourself. So not only was I showcasing that I was being myself, but the people that I would bring on were really, really unique. So they had gone through really hard times and I interviewed them to see how they persevered. So one person, his father died by suicide when he was like one years old. So just navigating that growing up without a father, we interviewed, I interviewed him about that. I interviewed a transgender person talking about their experience. Um, I'm trying to forget as another person I interviewed had has two parents that have chronic illnesses. So just talking about her growing up with two people, you know, two parents that she doesn't know if they're going to live the next day. So just really, really inspiring people to see, you know, their struggles in life and how they came out. They're stronger than ever now. So that was my goal behind it. And honestly, the Tay Talks really helped me get the job of Spectrum News because I brought that up in my interviews with them. And they were like, this is the type of reporting we're trying to do. So I think it really helped me get that job. So I'm happy I did it. And I met some really cool people through those interviews. Yeah, that is something that stood out to me. I remember hearing about um, or just even your story here. And when like we heard about the whole Spectrum News job opportunity that like they really are focused in that, that whole like we are sticking with the people that we're reporting about. And it's not just like the sort of one off kind of reporting just for the heck of it. It's that like. I mean, of course, journalism naturally makes an impact on people, but I feel like one of the one of Spectrum's goals is like really like we are actively like trying to just like help people out with our reporting, at least from what I've seen, I guess, in terms of just how they the kind of stories they try to do. So especially with that one about the plasma, I think, because that's it has implications for everyone. But um, yeah, that was kind of cool to see. Yes, yeah, so Spectrum News is so we're twenty four seven, like you said, yeah. and we are in like thirteen states, I think, around the country and growing, and. LA started like years ago. So they're really up and running. They're doing well. I think Austin, Texas, they're doing really well. And the Midwest is growing significantly. So they're actually giving us a lot of money to like grow in the digital realm, hire more reporters. So we're, we're, we're significantly growing, which is awesome. We started in 2018 um, and we're a 24 hour news station. We do things differently. So we're really trying to do character driven stories, more positive stories. So we don't go live as often as other reporters would. Usually at a regular station, you'd come in and you're you're sent out on a story and you're going to go live that day. And it's usually like on a fire or a death or something that's going on in the community, which is important, obviously. Um, but we're trying to do more character, like what are people doing in this world to make it better? Character profiles, um, the convalescent plasma, kind of like think pieces, get people to think about new perspectives. I try to bring in the LGBTQ community a lot. My beat is diversity. So I also hear from like the black community try to bring in different perspectives so that when people view my stories, you know, they're seeing a different viewpoint. So it's cool. Like we get to do really meaningful stories, which you probably wouldn't be able to do. Like if I pitched some of the stories that I've done at a regular station, they'd probably be like, no. <laughs> I love to hear that freedom that you have. That's really yeah. cool. Um, all right. So Drea, Michael, I mean, you guys are on there too, but there's four of us, I think. Let's see. Um, any of you that are here, or in class because you just have general questions. We'll just go for it like we normally do. Can ask me anything. I'm an open book. 
Anything about how to piece the story together? Is anyone like looking to go into journalism? <laughs> Against their will. I have a question, spot. but I don't know how to say it. Get it out and we'll look. For like a really long time, I've been struggling to find out like who I am. Because for the past three years, I've been trying to figure out if I'm transgender or if I'm just non binary or stuff like that. Do you have any advice for people who are trying to figure out? Who they are because you've talked to a lot of people who have already figured it out and like people who have, are still figuring it out but they know like what they want do you have any advice for people who don't well, first off, thank you for opening up and thank you for sharing i know that takes courage um i don't really have like honestly just like i say totally authentically you like just be you like it it, it takes a while to figure yourself out like it took me a while to come to terms with myself being gay i identified as bisexual and then i was scared to tell people um and, you know, I've like internalized homophobia, like, why am I like this, you know? But then you just realize like you are who you are. And if people want to be in your life, they'll be in your life, you know? Like, you just have to be you at the end of the day because life's too short. And so that's the best advice is like, just be true to who you are. And then obviously seek out resources, seek out people that do accept you and love you. There's a lot of LGBTQ community centers that will help out. Um, finding a mentor, I think is really, really a good idea. Um, but ultimately just sticking true to who you are and seeking out those resources and people that can support and love you, honestly. Thank you. Yeah, it can be tough to put a label on people because we're, 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 we are so much. So yeah, that's tough to label any bit. Yeah, especially with fans like mine. Yeah. They don't support transgender people. Like they don't care if you're bi or gay or anything. But if you're transgender or like non-binary, they think you should stay your gender. Like if you're born a certain thing for a reason, you shouldn't change it. And then when I came out to them as transgender about a few months ago, they asked me why. And like you can't explain that stuff. It's just, it's just you know. Yeah. If, if I'm a I try to give voices to a lot of different communities. Like my beat, I had, we don't have like beats. We just have like focus areas. So my focus area is diversity and sustainability. So once a week, I'm supposed to have a diversity piece or a sustainability piece. And uh, when Dr. Rachel Levine, I believe she is being confirmed. Was she confirmed yesterday or something? She's in there to be confirmed, but she'll be the first openly transgender doctor if confirmed by the U S Senate. So <laughs> I talked, to, I talked to some doctors that identify as transgender and non-binary and kind of what that means to their community. So in my reporting, I'm trying to give voices to the unheard and the viewers can see these perspectives and really get a different viewpoint and, you know, think of, like, see an actual person, hear what they're saying, see that they're just normal. You know, that's my whole point is just to give viewpoints to the unheard and open up, I guess, open up the viewers' minds a bit. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Sadie. What was one of your favorite stories to like write or cover? Huh, let me go to my, my page. I've done so many. We do. I do literally one a day. I'm I'm on a day turn schedule right now. The, some of the other reporter, some of the other reporters were doing like this rose and bloom style method. So they shoot like four or five stories in a week, and they're all due on Friday. I have to do a day turn each day, so. My stories run together a lot. <laughs> there was one story that I did about um, former shelter dogs helping people with mental illness. So that was really cool. Like this lady trains former shelter dogs to help people like to become the dogs become psychiatric service dogs. So I got to speak with someone who had like schizophrenia and some other mental illnesses on how the dog has really helped them and get up close video of the dog. And she opened up and shared her story with me. So that was really powerful. Um, I also love sharing the LGBTQ stories. I've done a lot of those in terms of like the Supreme Court of the United States announcements. I always try to bring in a perspective on how that affects the LGBTQ community. Um, and my favorite are the ones we can do in person. So we have done a lot virtually, but we have been able to go in person if the time allows for it and the, and the person I interviewed is okay with that and comfortable. 
So I remember I did a story on a farm and just like followed this guy around like throughout his day and what he does. So it was really a visual story. Um, and got to get just like up close video of him and working with his chickens and turkeys and all that. Um, and so that was like a really visual, nice story. I love that. It's just about the dogs. Um, Miss Daly, um, my co-teacher, she got really excited when you mentioned that one because she uh, takes care of a whole lot of um, shelter dogs and even will like drive. I mean, you can better yeah, explain the job. Yeah, transport. Like she'll like transport dogs from one place kind of to another place where they can be cared for. And so, yeah, she's all, all about that. It was kind of cool to hear uh, that. I, I didn't know you get a Oh, yeah. It's big in college too. Like in colleges, you can like in our college, Ohio University, you could like have a dog if it was like I don't know what registered maybe. Like there wasn't a lot you had to like, do. But like therapy yeah. dog. Yeah, that's a very very real thing. Yeah. That's therapy. Dog therapy is real. <laughs> I need a dog therapy. My dogs just bite me all the time. They're evil. I mean my my older dog doesn't, but my puppy does. Yeah. Puppies probably just play with puppies. <laughs> she shouldn't be playing with those. Those are dangerous. I know. We celebrate whenever there's puppy teeth in the way. She, but she's mean. She, she knows she has little sharp teeth. She, she'll... Michael, JJ, or Andrea, you guys are on here. Okay, Any questions okay. you guys have for Kayla? JJ just hopped in. I stopped in. So you guys are also welcome if you want to type them into the chat. I know it's kind of weird. You guys that are virtual right now because we have people here, then you're in there. So if you just want to speak up, turn your mic off, you can go for it also. Patience has a question. Go for it. Wait, I can't hear her. I got you. So she has, Patience had a good question. It was, so with having to do one story every day, does it get stressful for you? And how do you deal with that? Oh, that's a good oh, question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of planning that goes into, into our week. So we have a, uh, I have a one-on-one -on -one call with my executive producer each week on a Wednesday and things are changing right now. Like we're, we're building a lot. So I don't even know if that day is going to stay the same, but in the past I had a one-on-one -on -one with her. And so as I'm working through my stories for this week, I'm already thinking ahead to next week. Cause she's asking for five story ideas for the next week. So that once they're approved on our planning call, then I can start setting them up. So it's a, it's a lot of planning ahead. There's a lot of me asking people for story ideas, looking on Facebook and things, trying to find story ideas because it's constant. You have to plan ahead. Otherwise, I mean, my, my, my anxiety gets so high that I'm like, you know, because if I don't have something for air, then I didn't do my job for the day. So I'm very specific. I'm following up to people just saying like, hey, we're good to go on this date. See you at 1030 in the morning because my I do do the day turns. The other people might have some more flexibility because they have to have four stories done, you know, by Friday. But mine's a day turn. So just planning ahead, like one week, two weeks in advance, setting up stories. It can be stressful, but if you stay on top of it, usually everything comes together. So <laughs> that was a good question. Thanks for answering that. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking about that. I was like, yeah, that that's, uh, I think the cool thing though is like, that's your focus. So you are able to just, it's not like you have, like you're kind of taken away, like versus WAB or a smaller news station where you do have about 20 different roles during one week. You're able to focus solely on reporting, getting your interviews, editing your stories together. Do, do you do all, all of it yourself, actually, like the editing? I think you might have mentioned that already. But Yeah, so I, we are our own MMJs. We do everything. So um, I shoot, I write, I edit. Everything that you see, like on the convalescent plasma story, I did everything. The video, though, specifically when it's uh, the virtual interviews and stuff, we're using a lot of generic B-roll. You could see I credited the Red Cross. Like they sent me some of the convalescent plasma because – that's kind of hard to find. So if it's a virtual interview, you can find generic B-roll. But for the most part, I'm shooting everything. But we shoot on our phones, actually. Oh, it was it was a little sound we just took care of on our end. But thank you. Thank you for answering that. Yeah, it's cool to know that you do do everything. Well, you're fine, Miss Daly. It's all, all is good. All is good. <laughs> I'm surprised it wasn't my computer this time, Brown. Right? No, I used your Brown computer. I can deal with that. Yeah, we've all got we've all become numb to that. <laughs> Sadie, you, you did say you had a good question. I'll, I'll say it before you come back. But Michael, Drea, or JJ, you guys too. If you have questions, just go ahead. Hey, 
Yeah. So yeah, Sadie's question was, is there ever a week or what happens if you aren't able to come up with like five stories a week or has that ever happened or anything like that? So really, I ask myself that question every time. I'm like, it, what if I don't have a story for air? Like what's going to happen? Typically our executive producer, like she's been really good. She has story ideas if you need something last minute to come up with. So we do work as a team. She'll send me a press release or she'll, you know, reach out to her contacts and find something if we really, really are struggling to find something or if something fell through, like let's say an interviewee canceled for that day. So the executive producer is really good. We're also building up our planning team. So I assume that if we really need help, the planning team will help us find some stories. But for the most part, like fingers crossed thus far, like knock on wood, things have come together. There's been days where I've been like, you know, a day out and I'm like, I don't have a story for, for Thursday and it's Tuesday. And I, that's stressing me out because people, you know, don't say yes to an interview, like really quickly. They like to have a lot of planning time, especially in the pandemic. Um, but for the most part, it's all worked out. You just reach out to people, keep bugging them, ask your planning team, ask your executive producer, and usually something comes together. <laughs> Yeah, the whole team teamwork part is so good to hear too, and the importance of that. That you're not just like in it alone. You're not competing with people you're working with. You're helping each other. Yeah, we have actually. I think we have like ten. We have the largest team at Spectrum News, um, in Cleveland. So we have a group chat, and if something fell through or we need a contact, we'll just text our group chat, and everyone's usually really, really helpful. Like it's we're we're not competing against each other at all. Like we get team dinners together sometimes just on our own doing. So we have a really good team up in Cleveland and they've been really helpful if something fell through, especially for like weekend stories. I worked the Wednesday through Sunday shift for a long time. So I had Monday and Tuesdays off, which was not an ideal shift to have, but it, it, it you know, it is what it is. And if something fell through on a Saturday or Sunday, it's hard to get a hold of people, right? They're on their, they're not checking emails. Um, so we would text and they would send something and help me out. So it is good to have, you know, strong people around you have a good team. It's been good. Love it. You can come in. Okay, I have one to talk Yeah, you can. Really? But yeah, she's really fun. Any experience or encounters with Michael Simon? Any encounters with Michael Simon up in Cleveland? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that can be part of your story. Michael Simon. <laughs> he is an iron chef. He used to be a co-host on The Two, and he started out in Cleveland, and he has two restaurants, and he's the first one to have advertised Right, Brussels sprouts and start that trend, and he he he, he loves the brown. <laughs> Do you know? Yes. Yes. The fried Brussels sprouts. And she has a crush. Yes. Oh, oh. You know, one of the celebrity crushes. You know, yeah. like, because I haven't met him yet. I like the sound of Michael Simon. There you go. What's he look like? What do you Oh, he's, he's not what you call him. Taylor said he's bald. <laughs> bald. <laughs> old. No, he's bald. Oh, oh. 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 he's bald. Oh, 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 he's Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Happens to the best of us. What? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm not. I mean. <laughs> All right, my friends. Well, keep them coming. Those are good questions. And are you guys on there, I know I keep saying it, but Michael, JJ, and Drea. What are you saying? Is getting together people on the computer? Yeah. Start asking you guys are awesome showing up. So I know you have some questions probably. Maybe. <laughs> And you can type them into the chat too, JJ, Michael, and Drea. <laughs> what about, oh, go ahead, patients. Yeah, well, what are the other, who are the other journalists that uh, inspired you and that you look up to? Wow, that's a good question. 
Um, so I, I interned for the Today Show twice. Once was in New York City and once was in Los Angeles. And so the NBC team in general really inspires me. I love Hoda. People used to think my mom or people think my mom looks like Hoda. So growing up, I would hear that a lot. So I would always watch Hoda. And I think she's just so genuine and so good at what she does. So Hoda was definitely an inspiration to me and still is. And then Gotti Schwartz, Steve Patterson. Um, there are a couple journalists at NBC right now, uh, or correspondents. And Gotti Schwartz does the Stay Tuned. I don't know if you guys have Stay Tuned on Snapchat, where it comes up and they just do like quick, simple like news stories, I guess, for teenagers to understand, I guess. Um, and so he is probably like 30, 35 or something like that and just delivers the news in a really simple, concise, easy to understand way so that people just get, you know, they get what they need. So I watch that every day and they really inspire me just to become, you know, I, I write typically very lengthy. My packages tend to be way longer than they should be. So they inspired me to write shorter and just the way they tell stories, it's very engaging. So a lot of the people at the MB NBC were definitely inspirations to me and still are. I always remember you did a story where you were on a roller coaster at one point out in LA, right? You're in NBC in California. Yeah, yeah. actually, when I was in LA, um, I did so much. I was the only intern in LA. So I was kind of like a researcher in a, in a sense, not even an intern. I was helping the producers with their stories. And it was Natalie Morales. She was the correspondent for a story. And so I got to be in one of those episodes with her sitting right next to her on a roller coaster. And we went down and got soaking wet because it was one of those wet roller coasters. But that was cool. And then I also came out to a producer who was gay at the NBC Today Show and told, told him my story. And I was like, you're looking for people to interview that are LGBTQ. I myself identify as that. If you need, I don't know if that's a conflict of interest. They ended up asking the... Um, news director and she said yeah so I got interviewed and I basically came out on live television not live television but I came out in a piece that aired on live television so that was like probably the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life so far <laughs> was just be sharing my story and being a part of that piece so I got to be a part of I think two or three pieces when I was there it was awesome Yeah, thanks for sharing that tidbit. That's fun. <laughs> That's so fun. I remember you, you had so much thinking. You were able to just do so much hands-on stuff there. So that was really cool to see, yeah. especially with Natalie Morales. Um, yeah, go on, man. Where is, like, the farthest place you traveled to do Do you hear that one? No. She said, where, so Maddie said, where is the farthest place that you've traveled to do an interview? Okay, so the farthest place I've traveled is probably Columbus. So I'm in, we have to stay in Ohio just because it's the Ohio network, it's Ohio station. Um, and we have reporters in Cincinnati, Akron, Cleveland, Columbus. I don't think, I don't know if we have any in Dayton or I don't know which one's closest to that, but I think reporters can travel there. But I've just done, because I have a lot of contacts in Columbus. So if I'm really looking for a story idea or I think the story idea is really good, then I'll travel to Columbus. Um, so that's about two and a half hours from me. You know, not a super fun drive, but it is what it is. Never in the, all the corners of Ohio spectrum. Yeah, I saw that. They have, they have a, you know, I don't think, yeah, I don't know if they have one in Cincinnati yet, but I know, yeah, Columbus and Cleveland, that's all. In terms of units. Do you want more? No. maybe something something that they've always asked in the past is like I think you've kind of already answered this but maybe like what's the hardest part of your job like currently what is the thing that just like stresses you out the most and then maybe kind of a two-part question what also surprised you the most after leaving college and getting into this job like, well what are some things that you didn't expect that you were kind of thrown into pulling into this so the hardest part of my job I would say yeah, there's another question in the chat, too, that I can answer yeah, after. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the hardest part is probably the lack of newsroom experience. I'm like a people person. I like to wake up, you know, bring my coffee and be like, hey, everybody. But right now I wake up, I go downstairs in the basement, and I just work by myself. <laughs> so that's really difficult. I mean, we do go out on stories, and I, you know, I meet people in person, which is awesome. 
but just the lack of like in-person team experience is is hard for me because I like just asking questions. Like if you're in a newsroom setting, if you have a question, someone comes over and helps you right there and everything's solved. But this, because we're working from home and a lot of it is because of the pandemic, you know, you have to call people, you have to figure out who to even call because I joined during the pandemic. So I don't, I never met anyone really. I didn't know who the IT person was. I didn't know who, you know, this person was that I needed help with. So that's probably the, the hardest part. Um, and what was the other part of your question? And then like, what, what are some things about just, you know, being a full-time reporter now that surprised you that maybe you didn't learn from just college things that just, yeah, things that surprised you. Hmm. Probably that it just never stops. <laughs> like in college, you know, you had flexibility to do like, you know, two, three stories a week, come in here and there, but obviously you had classes on top of that. So you were busy doing other things. But I just remember in college being like so eager to get my first job. Like I was like ready to start and I had such high goals for myself and I still do have a lot of goals for myself. But once you're in it, you're like, man, you sh you really should enjoy college, like enjoy high school, enjoy where you're at. Because once you do get into that, you know, real world, it's go, go, go. Like you've got to do a story each day and you got to make it work, you know? So as much as you, you know, you can have goals and aspirations for yourself and definitely do things in high school and college to, to reach them and help you achieve them. But enjoy the present moment because, you know, once you're in it, it's, it never, it never stops. And then I don't, I don't know where the chat was. Let's see. Hung up on her. I almost hung up on you and accidentally doing that. Um, I'll, I can go ahead and read JJ's question. JJ and Michael both had a couple of good ones. So JJ's was, what's the self barrier you had to overcome in order to better your career? probably confidence. A self barrier would definitely be confidence. I remember freshman, sophomore year at WUB at OU, I just felt like I didn't have any experience. I didn't have anything to bring. And I just wanted to soak up everything and learn everything. But I was afraid to speak up. I was afraid to go into the newsroom and be like, you know, let me be the producer today. Let me anchor. Like, let's do this because of conf lack of confidence. I didn't feel like I had the internships yet or the experience to really add up to anything. But as a senior, I was telling the freshmen, like, don't think that way. Like, we're in college. We're all here to learn, despite what, if you're a senior or a freshman, like, some of the freshmen were better than the seniors. Like, it doesn't matter about your age. As long as you want to come in and you have the drive to learn, do that. So probably self-confidence. I've definitely grown a lot since I've gotten this job and just through college. And everyone's on their own path. But just don't be afraid to, like, jump in there and ask questions and learn and stand up for yourself. Like if you want to anchor, ask, say, hey, when do you think I could anchor? Don't just think you're not good enough or not ready yet to do so. Yeah, thank you for answering that. And then Michael does have a good one too, is just does your sexual orientation cause difficulties in your work or just daily life? That's a good one. I honestly haven't had any issues at my work. They're actually very, like we have a diversity task force at Spectrum News. So they're really trying to be progressive and give people the platform to speak up if there's something that's going on. And we've got, you know, the diversity task force that we come together once a month and talk about things. So they're really trying to make the people on air reflect your communities and the communities that you serve have people of all different, you know, races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, gender identities, everything. So they're trying to be very progressive. So at work, I haven't really had any issues. I'm not like super open though. I don't like come out and say, hi, I'm gay every time I say, you know, meet somebody. So I'm not sure who knows, but I'm pretty out on my social media. So if you really wanted to look, you would probably know that I am. Um, in my daily life, in a way, I mean, I haven't really had any issues with it, but you do like, I have internalized homophobia sometimes. Like, why am I gay? You know, I try to think of that. So I'm just trying to get over that. And then of course, you know, lesbians are over-sexualized. So in, in that sense, you've got people saying some rude stuff sometimes, but it never anything that's like, I don't like you because you are. It's more just like over-sexualizing, you know. So I do experience it to some degree, but not as bad as I guess some people have and could. So I've been lucky. Well, we appreciate you, Taylor, for all of this so much. Uh, I, th I think a good one <laughs> I always have to like, like wrap wrap it up is always just like, advice you'd have for 
like high schoolers or how advice do you have for them in my classes? Um, because yeah, some of them are here just because they were placed in this class. Some of them are kind of interested. There's just a varying level of interest in it naturally. So just yeah. like, advice for like doing stories, getting ideas and just um, using, you know, what they have right now to just like write stories and be inspired about journalism. Like what, that was very big. Um, advice you have for, yeah, they have, they have one minute to answer that question. But yeah, no, I, I guess just anything related to journalism, advice you give to a high schooler who is interested in this might not be, but has to do stories here and there. Yeah, okay. So I went to Granville High School, which didn't have um, the like program that you guys have there, which is awesome, the program you guys have. Um, so I was like a Girl Scout and I just wanted to be, I wanted to make sure I could get into OU. So if you're really interested in getting into something and you don't have, a journalism class or a writing class at your school. I was a Girl Scout and I, I spoke in front of like large audiences, which I thought would relate to broadcast journalism. So really, I just tried to like do what I could to make uh, me, I guess, marketable to OU to get in. And then honestly, just like I said, enjoy your enjoy the present moment. Like don't put too much pressure or stress on yourself. You've got four years to graduate college to get that first job. Like just you're going to learn and grow more about yourself and what you want to do each day. So just take it slow and just be present in the moment and enjoy. That's my best advice, I would say. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's good. Um, wait, we haven't gotten through this, but let's get. Wait, we can do round of applause. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Taylor. <laughs> These are virtual. The perfect timing. That's the bell. Um, you guys Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, when, when the bell get, when the bell goes like that, JJ saying some claps in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and hit the end recording thing right now so it saves. Stop.